the initial positive assessment of King Solomon, Shlomo HaMelech, in chapters 3, 4, and 5, make it hard to process his eventual descent into sin in chapter 11. How are we to appraise the positive persona of King Solomon in the earlier chapters with the knowledge of his descent into sin? Also, the sages argued as to what the sin was and how to appraise King Solomon's sin itself. How do you read these Agadot and Midrashim? Okay, so it's a great question. And it's a really good follow-up from our last one because, uh, you know, even this year I was teaching one of my classes in Midrash and was teaching uh, the story of Shlomo. And they genuinely had a hard time. They really, they just didn't know. They, they didn't understand how can we still keep Shlomo as a hero? Look at him as, you know, a sacred person and one of the Jewish heroes if he did Avodah Zarah in, his, in the end of his life. So let's just put down the, the uh, perspective and, um, you know, the, the beginning, the middle and the end, and then we'll have to try and grapple with it. Um, if when you open Malachim Aleph Parent Gimel, we read there um, in Pasuk Gimel, that Shlomo loved God and he went in the, in, the, in the laws of David and later on he has this amazing dream and we see his humility, we see the way that God sees him so um, in positive and glowing terms and in fact he's the one who wants to do mishpat and when you read idyllic images of Naviim of, of kings, sorry. You can take a look, for example, in Tehillim at Perak Pehe, at Perak Ayin uh, Bet. Um, you see that always you can talk about Ishayahu, uh, Perak Yud. They talk in, in almost messianic terms about the image of a king and no, it wasn't Pehe. One second, let me just get my. I'm getting myself mixed up. Not pay, but some... Yeah, what I meant was memhe. But okay, memhe. Whichever way, not memhe, but not pay, hey, memhe. But whichever way, we have this idea that it's almost like messianic is perfect, the idea of somebody who wants mishpat, and that's the, the primary thing which is concerning the king. Not women, not wealth, not, uh, you know, susim. And indeed, Shlomo HaMelech is the person who builds the Beis HaMikdash and he has a magnificent prayer in Perak Fet where he says all the right things. And he's the one who actually sets up the Beis HaMikdash, um, this incredible office where, you know, the stated goal here is the mandat kol that all the world should know ki Hashem elokim ein od. Like what we say in Aleinu, hu elokeinu ein od. We, 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 this is what we want. If that's true, then what do we do with the end of Shlomo? Perak Yud Aleph, we hear about his sins. And it's difficult to say that he didn't sin because God tells him he sins. And God tells him that for that reason, the kingdom is going to be split. What sin is he accused of? He's accused in his old age. He, first of all, instead of he loved many foreign women. The nations that God says you shouldn't even marry, that they will let your heart stray. And then in verse 4 it says, in his old age, his wives led his heart astray after other gods. And in fact, it gets even worse than that, where it says, um, he follows other gods, he builds Altars to other gods. What happened to Shlomo? In fact, there's even a midrash, uh, a midrash which talks about Shlomo having been captured by Ashmedai, the, the, the king of the demons, as if to say, and he put a surrogate Shlomo in his place. It's like some science fiction movie, right? Like they put a surrogate, like some sort of avatar of, of Shlomo in his place, but the real Shlomo is there, muffled and kicking taken by the demons because you know, you know what I love about that midrash because it just can't be this can't be the same Shlomo this must be some sort of demonic Shlomo which, 
there by somebody else. And the other Shlomo is sitting in the trunk of a car somewhere, right? <laughs> this can't be the same guy, right? <laughs> I love it when Midrash does this, right? But it's effectively, I think that's what the men are doing. And it's really a big, a big, big question. So really, how do we deal with it? Um, and let me add that there is a fascinating passage in Avot Rabbi Natan, which actually says that for centuries after Shlomo's death, um, they literally put in the Geniza, Shir Hashir and Kohelet and Mishlan. They didn't want those books, that he was Sona non grata, until Anshik Nesad Adola came along and reinterpreted the books and found ways of giving Parshanut to the books. And we, we all know that the sugyot about Kohelet and Shir Hashirim that were very controversial. And many people have explained that it's not only the books that are controversial, but the author. So this is the question. Do you take the early Shlomo as your key? Do you take the late Shlomo as your key? Was he, was he, was he this, uh, you know, idolater all the time, but he put on a good front? Was he a good religious man, but somehow he got led astray? And if he's so clever, why did he get led astray? So I gave a certain approach in, in my book, which to me, I, I identify in many ways with the religious Zionist world here in Israel, with the modern Orthodox community, in, in, as it's called in the States. And the modern Orthodox community is very into the fact that, yes, we're religious, we keep all the mitzvot, but we're open to wider culture. We're open to both higher culture and lower culture. And I always look at Shlomo as a very cautionary tale about how open can you be? And let me try and explain. Um, Shlomo is an incredible king. He takes David's kingdom and turns it into an empire. We read about certain things which he does. I'll give you an example. He is has all this knowledge. Now it tells us, for example, um, let me just find the right in Parak Hay. It talks about the Shmo at Tavunahar He had great wisdom. And what do you have wisdom about? It talks about that. Oh, and by the way, it says he had more wisdom than all the Bene Kedem and all the wisdom of Egypt and the wisdom of, and it mentions all different people. His reputation was with everybody. What did he talk about? It says, He had 3,000 Mishalim. What's Mishle? Mishle is like ethics, philosophy. This is literature, the literature department. And then it says, He spoke about plants from the great mighty Sira to the, to the Hyssop. In other words, he used a botany. And then he spoke about the Off and the Remes and the Dagi and the Behima. In other words, he knew zoology. We see people like the Queen of Sheba, all different people coming. In other words, he wanted Jerusalem to be the Oxford and Cambridge, the Harvard and Yale, whatever you want to call it, the tech, I'll talk in Israeli terms, the Hebrew University and the Technion, right? And that everybody should come and come to the latest, you know, startup ideas, high tech, new technology is Jerusalem. I can give you messianic images of what this is, right? When, when we read Yeshayahu Perak Bet, Perak Bet, and Yeshayahu Perak Bet says that in, 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 in messianic times, that all the world will come to Jerusalem in the, in the end of days. And it even says, and in Jerusalem, they will judge peoples so much so that they will turn their swords into pruning hooks and then they, you know, etc. They won't fight anymore. Why? Because they'll come to Jerusalem will be the international court of law. People will come to Jerusalem because they'll be the wisest, kindest place to go and adjudicate all of your disputes. Shlomo wanted Jerusalem to be that. When Shlomo opens the Migdash, what did he do? He said, he invited non-Jews in. He says that non-Jews will come to Jerusalem. Pasuk, um, 
Mem Aleph, the Gamel Anochria, Shalom Eam Chai even non Jews will come to Jerusalem because they'll hear about your great name and your mighty hand and they'll pray in this house. He wanted the world to come to Jerusalem. He wanted Jerusalem to export monotheism. Hmm. Shlomo loved the world. He loved knowledge. He was a cosmopolitan man and he thought that if we create a strong Jerusalem with a sense of Hashem, but we make it into the center of world knowledge, technology, and faith, people will come to Jerusalem and they won't only learn all about sciences, but they will also come from Mishpat and Staka and they will come and believe in God. And therefore, he says that they will come to Jerusalem because they'll hear about your great name. And the Pasuk I quoted before that we say at the end of Hoshanot, and by the way, who says this? The Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba visits Jerusalem. And she says, blessed is Hashem, Yudkei Vavke, who puts you on the throne of Israel. Hashem loves you. And he says, the values of Ram Avinu, the values of Hashem. But here the question is, right, after 20 years, after 30 years, after 40 years, as the standard of living rises, right, where Shlomo manages to hold this balance, when you open the door so wide, do you succeed in exporting what you want? Or at some point, do you import? What's a good mashal for this? And then I'll, you mentioned a midrash, so I'll give you a midrash. <laughs> What's the mashal? Imagine a man who, I don't know, he was very poor. He had to work, grew up, and his father worked so hard. His father worked in sweatshops to make, you know, put stuff on the table, bread on the table, right? And then he says, I'm going to, I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to build a business. So I'll be able to spend time with my children, not like my dad, never had time to spend with me. Business gets so big and so overwhelming that the, the dad's always in the office. He still never spends time with the kids because he, he built a monster and then the monster's controlling him instead of he's controlling the monster. Chazal in the Midrash talk about this in a beautiful way. They give a very interesting analogy. They say, and... This is certainly not shut. That night that Shlomo dedicated the Beit Mikdash was the same night that he married the, queen, uh, the, uh, the daughter of Pharaoh, the princess of Egypt. And there were two parties going on, the dedication of the temple, the music, <laughs> and the marriage party with all sorts of Egyptian music. In fact, it says that, according to one drush, she danced a thousand dances that night. And what's a thousand dances for a thousand gods, a thousand cultures? And God says, what party should I attend? In other words, it's very nice. You're dedicated to God, but you also got your wives. Something a bit not good here. And then the Midrash ends up with the idea that Shlomo spent the night with the daughter of Pharaoh, but he oversleeps in the morning. He oversleeps, uh, you know, and he, his wife has to knock, his, sorry, his mother has to knock on the door and say, Shlomo, wake up, we need to do, bring the Korban Tamid. And she takes him out of his nuptial bed in order to bring the Korban Tamid. What, what, what is this Midrash saying? It's saying that Shlomo has two loves. And I would argue that throughout his life, he has two loves. He loves the world and the cosmopolitan and the exposure. And he thinks, I'll be able to expose uh, the world to God. At some point, he can't hold it. Now, the reason why I say it's a cautionary tale for modern orthodoxy, sometimes we find ourselves in that situation. We say our core is strong, we've got Torah and mitzvot, we're not going to fall, you know, we're not going to get in, fall down the Netflix rabbit hole, we're not going to, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, right? And, and we, we're going to keep our values. And then at some point we realize that I don't know if keeping our values, right? We look around and it's not so easy necessarily to create a, a Jewish core. And to think the Shlomo, wisest of all people, he himself wasn't able to necessarily hold the rudder straight, it means that we ask ourselves, you know, and, and, and say, fine, I understand that we want, uh, you know, these different things pulling at us, but if he couldn't get it quite straight, then we should, you know, we should be careful. And we should uh, start thinking for ourselves what, you know, what, to be honest, about the dangers of exposure, of uh, open door policies, et cetera, et cetera. I once sat with an amazing educator 
um, Esti Rosenberg, the head of Migdal Oz. And she turned around and said, you know, when we educate our young people today, we ask them to do, we ask too much of them. It, you can't be a great sportsman also to accept school, get into the best universities and also to learn to learn, also to be from and also to know all of the Netflix shows and also to be a madrich and also to vol something's got to give yeah something's got to give there are few people who can do this but most people they can't they can't you know play on so many bases at the same time so can we can we hold the tension can we hold the tension of exposure to the world, Shlomo wanted to be exposed. They had all these marriages. They were connections with different kingdoms, and yet, and still keep our pure faith, our pure religious direction. So that's why I sit with my students and learn Shlomo, <laughs> and we 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 discuss it. And you know, it takes us a long while to get through it, but I hope that the message gets through. And again, I'm, I'm coming didactically to tell them do this. Right, I much prefer that people sit with the dialectic and they sit with the tension and they understand that you know that that it's a real world and that we do need it. We do need to involve with the world. We need to study. We need to be worldly. And at the same time, um, we've got to ask ourselves if we're on the air, the you know vayasaya shar so based on a lot of the psukhum that you were quoting that kind of hints towards, you know, what would lead to his downfall, it seems like the text kind of sets you up with it. If you're reading carefully, you can sort of see that it sort of kind of builds itself into what's going to happen, if according to sort of what you're saying. But I, I, I like what you're saying. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I frequently, when I read the narrative of Shlomo, I always say, when you read it the first time, you read it through and it all sounds so great until you get to the last verse and it's a big letdown. Then read it another time and you see all the warning signs. <laughs> you see all of the mistakes and you, you see God warning him and he got, he's building the temple and God says, you know, this is great, but only if you keep my mitzvahs. And we're Hashem saying, you know, Shlomo, watch out. And Shlomo could hear that, right? And he says it more than once. And um, first of all, that's the, that's the nature of life. I do appreciate some people, my students every time say to me, what does Shlomo say to God? He says, look, all I want is a heart to understand my people. And God says, because you asked for that and you didn't ask for wealth and you didn't ask for the, 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 the victory in war, I'm going to give you all of it. And you're like, if you hadn't given him the wealth, then he wouldn't have gone in so much trouble, right? So it's a good question, but on the other hand, if he hadn't had the wealth, he might not have been able to do all the things he had done. Right. And frequently it's not so simple that you can have one without the other. We get a lot of blessings, and as we all know, every blessing is a double-edged sword. Um, and uh, as I said before, a person can be successful in business, they still have to decide what are their priorities. A person can have tsaras, they've got to decide what are their priorities. And every blessing you know, can be a blessing. There's a lovely Nesiv where it says, Yivarecha Hashem v'yishmarecha. Rashi says, Yivarecha Hashem, God should bless you, v'yishmarecha, that he won't take it away, right? That he'll protect you, he'll give you wealth, but he won't take it away. But the Nesiv says very beautifully that every blessing can always have a, an underside to it, <laughs> right? Israel can win wars, but it can become overly materialistic. Right, an individual can become very wealthy, but they can spoil their kids, um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But with every blessing comes opportunity, but also comes opportunity to fail. We hope our blessings will be blessings and <laughs> not the opposite. Uh, so beautiful. That's well, what I would say. Very well said. So moving now to 